And now it's my pleasure to introduce our final speaker for this evening. He's worked in various assignments and roles across all PepsiCo divisions and functions. He started his PepsiCo career at Frito-Lay in 1976 as a janitor in its Rancho Cucamonga plant. He is recognized as a creator of the Flaming Hot line products, including Flaming Hot Cheetos, which influenced future ethnic products and the first Frito-Lay Hispanic marketing team. Please help me welcome the godfather of Hispanic branding, executive of multicultural sales and community activation for PepsiCo North America, Mr. Richard B. Montañez. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Give me a minute, I gotta cool down. <laughs> oh, that tastes good. What a, what a great pleasure and honor to be here. You know, when I got the invitation and I was asked, I was so excited. And the reason I was excited because I love talking to young people. And young people for the next, I think I got 15 minutes, right? We're in trouble because it takes me 20 minutes to introduce myself. So listen carefully because I've got something to say and I want to say it to the young people. You've been hearing a lot about dreams and success. Well, I'm here to also tell you the same thing. That there isn't anything that you can't accomplish. When it comes to, this is what I love about LULAC. And it, and I also want to thank our sponsors. Because listen to me, when it comes to investing in our kids, our Latino kids always should be the best. You see, I come from a generation where it wasn't the best. They donated to us. Well, you know what I say today? Keep your donation. We don't need it, but we'll take your investment. Because that's what we're doing here. Young people, this is one of the best decisions you made was to be here today. This is an investment. But with every investment, there's an expectation. What is the return on that investment? Well, we're asking from you that all of you go out and achieve your dreams and become successful. Here's what it was like for me. Again, I come from that generation. I grew up in a small little town called Wasti. It was, a, it was a farm workers camp. I lived in a one room house with you know, my parents and my brothers and sisters. My grandfather picked grapes, my dad picked grapes, and guess what? I picked grapes. My whole life, childhood life, was always about leftovers and about donating, about getting in that welfare line, getting in that whatever line, getting in that. No one ever told me that I could be something great. No one ever took the time to invest in me. But I'm here today to give you one thing, is I'm going to give you a revelation. And I guarantee you're not going to leave the same in the next 10 minutes. What is that revelation? This revelation that I'm about to give you is going to lead you to a revolution. Not the kind that the government's worried about, okay? I'm talking about a revolution in your life. A revolution that one day you're mopping the floors and the next day you're an executive. But I want you to do one thing. I want you to use your imagination. Go back with me to 1962, 63. None of you were born in here. Maybe your parents weren't even born that year. This is what it was like. My mom getting me ready to go to school. You see, I grew up as a child during the civil rights movement of the 60s. Wasn't old enough to have an impact on the movement, but I was old enough that the movement had an impact on me. Here's what happened. 1960 something, little boy with his mom. Little boy is crying. Mama says, Chion, por que lloras? <laughs> Cry, baby, why are you crying? Porque no quiero ir a esa escuela. Because I don't want to go to that school. Y mama says, ¿por qué? Porque todos hablan inglés. Because everybody speaks English. I can't speak a word of English. 
What am I going to do at an all-English school? No choice. Got on the bus. My tío, my uncle, took me to the corner where the bus was picking us up. And guess what? The bus that showed up was green. And I remember I told my tío, why can't I get on the yellow bus? Why do I have to get on the green bus? You see, it wasn't until later, young people, listen, it wasn't until later. I didn't know what discrimination or diversity was, but it, later, as I got older, I realized, I get it. That was society saying, those, that group of kids, they're not good enough. Richard Montañez, you're not good enough to get on the yellow bus. Get on the green bus because we're going to parade you across town. But you see, that got into me. So I never thought as a little child that I was good enough. I, didn't, I, I just thought like, well, maybe it's the color of my skin. What is it? What is it? Why, why do we get treated this way? But then I got a revelation. Use your imagination. I get to school. Don't understand a word the teacher is saying. You know, one of my greatest regrets is I quit school at a young age. I never went to high school. But I tell people that, you know what, I'm probably the most uneducated, brilliant person you'll ever meet. I'm a genius. So I get to school, don't understand a word the teacher's saying. There was about eight or nine of us. And there's one sound that's international. Every kid understands this sound. And it was the sound of the recess bell. It was lunchtime. And I remember, oh, what a relief. So we grab our lunch, go and sit out in the playground, use your imagination. Don't remember how many kids were there. There was about nine of us that came off the bus. So we're sitting there, 1962, 63. And I remember I pulled out my lunch. I was getting ready to take a bite. And it was like this. Everybody was staring at me. So I put my lunch back in the bag. Why do you think uh, everyone was staring at me? It was a burrito. You got to remember this. The world hadn't seen a burrito yet. Contrary to popular belief, Taco Bell didn't introduce the burrito to the world. Me and my mom did. But the truth and the fact is, young people, listen to me. I was embarrassed. And I went home. I put it back and I went home and I told my mom, just like this. I said, Mama, hazme un bologna sandwich con un cupcake como los otros. Mom, make me a bologna sandwich and a cupcake like the other kids. Because I don't want to be different. Why can't I be like that other little boy? Why can't I ride the yellow bus? Why do I have to speak this language? Why do I have to eat burritos? I want to fit in. I want to be like the other kid. But my mom, there's something about Latinas. Yes. You know what? I'm, I'm going to say, I, I've said this a thousand times, and I'll say it another thousand times. When God created the Latinas, he was showing off. So my mom, being the marketing genius that she is, she said, no, mijo, this is who you are. So the next day, she made me two burritos. <laughs> and she said, here's one for you and one to share with a friend. So Wednesday was my burrito nightmare. Thursday, I shared a burrito with a friend. Friday, I was selling burritos for 25 cents a piece. <laughs> Listen to me, young people. That's the day that I got a revelation. That revelation was just maybe, just maybe none of us were created to fit in. We were created to stand out. Young people, 
I'm here to tell you, live your life. Stand out. Throw that dream out there. Let it be as crazy as you want it to be. I'll tell you what I tell people today. Even though I never went to school. Just imagine if I would have got educated. You know what I tell people? I'd be in the White House today, no doubt about it. So I'm telling you, get your education. Go as far as you can. Because if I can make it this far without an education, just imagine how far you can go with an education. So I got a hold of that revelation. And it caused a revolution in my life. That revolution was this. I was somebody special, that there was greatness inside of me. My job was to let it out. And I'm here to tell you it's the same thing for you. There's greatness in you. All you got to do is let it go. I've said this before. You don't need anybody's permission to become great. And if you feel like you need somebody's permission, well, I'm here tonight to give you that permission. You have my permission to be great. Revolution. I like who I am. I hope all of you love me, but if you don't, it's okay. You know why? Because I love me. <laughs> Young people, fall in love with yourself, because when you fall in love with yourself, there's a freedom to be yourself. <laughs> Revolution took place in my life. Things were changing. And I remember one day, a neighbor said, hey, they're hiring at Frito-Lay. I said, Frito-Lay? What if I could get a job there? What if I can change the destiny for the Montañez family? Maybe we don't have to work the fields anymore if I can get into that. A real job? My neighbor helped me fill out the application. I went and I gave him the application. You know what? I thank God for one thing. This was 1976. I thank God that uh, in my days they didn't do background checks. I got hired right on the spot. You know, a, a, a few years back, uh, when I, I'm from California, when uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger became governor of California, uh, I got a phone call from him, an actual phone call. And, and uh, he, was, he was inviting me to, he was giving me a government appointment. I didn't have to leave my job. And, and it was my good friend, Lupe, who works for, for PepsiCo, helped me to get into that position. So I thought about it, and he said, okay, let's do it. Put me in contact with uh, the appointment secretary, whatever you call him, you know, he faxed over a sheet of questions. And the first question was this, have you or anyone in your family ever done anything that would embarrass the governor of California? I go, this is a trick question because I'm Mexican. So we went through it, and all of a sudden, uh, he says, well, you know what? Great. Welcome. You've made it. Just one thing. We've got to do a background check. Well, how far back do you go? <laughs> so that day, I got hired. And I got hired as a janitor. And I remember I went home, and I told my dad and my grandfather. You know what they told me? When you mop that floor, don't forget that you are a Montañez. Let that floor shine. Work hard. Make people proud to know you. So I remember I had this attitude, and somebody said you were just a janitor. You know what? There's no such thing as just a janitor. No such thing as just a waiter. No such thing as just a bus driver. When you work hard and you have it in your heart that you're going to be the best at that, that's all that's important. So I said, I'm going to be the best janitor Frito-Lay ever had. Then one day, the CEO sends out an email. Uh, we didn't have email, so I'm lying there. Send out a video <laughs> back in the day, right? And he told all the workers, I want you to act like an owner. Another revolution was about to take place in my life. Listen, young people. There was about 500 factory workers in that room. And I was a janitor, so I was leaning against the wall. And I heard that. I saw that invitation. Here's my invitation 
Here's the CEO telling me, the janitor, that I can act like an owner. I get an opportunity. I saw it. I saw it. I said, well, I can do something. I didn't know what I was going to do. Didn't need to. Knew that I was going to act like an owner. So I went into action. I started to research what our company was all about. I started to go out in the markets. I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. Like that. I saw it. You know what a revelation is? A revelation is something that was there all the time, but it's been revealed. It's still, there are so many ideas and so many things that you can do right now that people haven't seen them yet. They just need to be unveiled. You need a revelation. So my revelation was simple. What would happen if I put chile on a Cheeto? So I made my own. You see, when, when you hear that I invented, I made the seasoning. I'm a little bit of an artist. I drew the graphics. I did everything. And I also believed what the CEO said. I didn't know any better. Sometimes it's okay to be naive to certain things. Sometimes it's okay not to know the rules because then you got to play by those rules. Somebody says, well, you need to do protocol. Well, no, I don't want to know protocol because then I got to enforce it. I didn't know any better. So I called them up. You got to remember, this was a long time ago. Janitors don't call CEOs. So I called them up. And his executive assistant was that. She was an exec. She was a visionary because she, she said, hang on. CEO is going to want to talk to you. I told her my idea. And this is what he said. I'll be in Cucamonga in two weeks, Richard. I hung up the phone. Listen, young people. I don't care what room you're in. There's always somebody in that room that's going to try to steal your destiny. Your job is to be ready and not allow it. Here's what happened. Hang up the phone. Happy as can be. The CEO is coming to see the janitor. Well, here comes the plant manager. Who do you think you are? Who gave you permission to call the president? Do you realize now I got to paint everything? I got to fix everything? And he said it just like this. You're doing the presentation. Then I thought for a moment, who am I? Who do I think I am? What right do I have to call the president? I didn't know what to do. But the Latina always knows. So I went to my wife. I said, what are we going to do? He said, I got to do it myself. I've never done a presentation. I never even went to school. She said, Let's go. we're going to go to the library. Check out a book on how to develop a marketing strategy. You know what I did? I copied <laughs> word for word everything that, I, that was in there. So two weeks come by. And I'm going through the story real quick because I know I only got a couple minutes left. Two weeks go by. Here they come. 50 people from headquarters, all senior executives, plus another 100 from, you know, in those days, if the CEO showed up, you better show up too. That's what it was like in those. So there, there, there I was. And if you remember, well, you don't remember, we had transparencies. You know, you had to put your thing here and make sure it lined up. And, and I went to, uh, I went to, a, to a, a, an old store, and I bought a tie for $3.50, and my neighbor actually tied it for me. So here I am. I'm getting ready, and guess what? I'm doing pretty good. I'm presenting it. But as I said, there's always somebody in the room that will try to steal your destiny, right? Well, it was going too good. And one of the marketing executives said, well, I have a question. I'm like, oh. No questions. <laughs> so he said, well, Richard, tell me, um, just how much market share 
are you talking about? Inside, I almost fainted. I was that little boy with the burrito again. Like, oh, my God, what am I doing here? I need to run out. I need to get out of here. I need, I need to just, like, I'm just a janitor. I remember I thought for a moment, Marcus Sheriff, I haven't read that chapter yet. <laughs> you know, I don't have a whole lot of things. But one thing that I do have, and I'm going to give you the antidote to fear right now. Get a hold of what I'm about to say right now. You'll never be afraid again. Because one thing I do have is I have courage. Here's where I got it. Go back to the third grade. It all happened for me in the third grade. Every Tuesday, two trainers would pull up. They were after school reading programs. One was for the non-Latino kids and the other one was for the Latino kids. Well, one Tuesday, I'm in line. The line that I was told to get into. Get in that line, Richard. That's your line. Well, guess what I did one Tuesday? I broke ranks. You should have heard my friends looking at me. Ricardo, that's loco. You're in the wrong line. This is your line. This is where they told us to get in. This is the truth. I looked inside. Two beautiful blonde ladies at the trailer. I looked at them, and I looked at my friends. This is the truth. I said this. They have cookies inside. I'm going to get us some cookies. So as I got closer, something got a hold of me. Fear like I've never had. I was afraid. I was afraid of being rejected. I was afraid that those two ladies were going to say, get out of this line, you belong over there. When I got there to the front, what do you think those two ladies did? They filled my pockets with cookies. Here's the moral of that story, because you're probably wondering, what does that have to do with anything? Here it is. There's a cookie that's been baked for each one of you. Your job is to get out of that line that they told you to get in and get under the cookie line. The other thing that you got to get a hold of, why did I get in that line? I was hungry. When you're hungry for that degree, fear will leave. When you're hungry for that promotion, fear will leave. When you're hungry to start that business, fear will leave. Remember, it's hunger, the antidote to fear. When you're hungry for that thing that you want to accomplish, you won't be afraid. So let's go back, and I'll answer that question when he said, how much market share? You see, many times I've said this, greatness will come in a ridiculous form. Many times you may have to look ridiculous. If you're a leader, sometimes you got to look beyond the ridiculous statement and see, see, I was fortunate because I had vision. And this is what vision did for me. When other people saw what I was, vision saw what I would become. The very thing that disqualified me, vision used to qualify me. So answering the question. You know, when you go to the store, the supermarkets, where they're called gondolas when you see all the chips, the gondolas? Well, when he said, how much market share? With the most ridiculous smile, I said, I thought about it. I said, oh, I got it. That much market share. <laughs> how ridiculous is that? And you know what the CEO did? He stood up and he said, ladies and gentlemen, do you realize that we have the opportunity to go after that much market share? There was a young man in that room who today is the CEO of Pepsi. He stood up and he told his sales team, sales, do you think we can go get that market share? What I'm saying is, many times, greatness will come in a ridiculous form. Are you willing to look ridiculous? Let me read this. This is for you. Young people. You serve a purpose with abilities and a genetic code that no one else has. And in all the ages of time, there has never nor will there ever be another like you. Live your life. Thank you.